my pleasure today to have with me a wonderful composer, Jimmy Lopez Bellido, um, born in Peru, trained in Finland and in UC Berkeley, living in San Francisco or the Bay Area. Uh, he has had performances by some of the world's greatest orchestra, including the Chicago Symphony, the Boston Symphony, the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Concerge Pau Orchestra, and so many more. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with me, Jimmy, and I thank you for making some, some time for this. It's my pleasure to, to be able to talk to you, Christian, today. So uh, I'll jump in. I know the time is, uh, the clock is ticking. So I'll, I'll go with the very first question, which is quite a simple one. And I just want to know how how did you be decide to become a composer? Uh, how did it all start for you? When, when and how did it start? You know, one thing I always say is that um, my experience is that composition as a profession kind of chose me rather than I choosing it. Uh, I think I, I discovered music when I was a young kid, uh, around five years old, but I never thought I would become a professional musician. At that time, my sister was uh, just practicing the electric keyboard and, and I got some interest in it as well and so I got some lessons but I think it wasn't until I turned 12 that I really came across the music of Bach and that was a little bit like a spark I don't know what happened in my brain but uh, listening to his inventions really excited something that was perhaps latent but um, you know the discovery of this intriguing counterpoint and these melodies weaving each other it's just something that you know got, got me hooked and i i just had to figure it out so i i'll go home and try to decipher these pieces because i, I wasn't really good at reading music either um and uh and it took some time but but through that i think that was my window into into music composition and the other factor was that there were i mean i was i loved the piano and but I, I didn't love practicing. Um, you know, the act of practicing is something that requires a certain kind of personality and patience for you to really, you know, bring a passage to perfection. And in my case, I was more interested in just seeing what was happening with the keys. And always, I would even challenge myself to not look at what was coming next and try to figure it out myself and try to get into the mind of a composer that way. And is your main instrument the piano? Is that how you started being acquainted with music? That's right. I started with the piano. and uh, But then in high school, I also learned the trumpet. And I actually played at the, my high school orchestra uh, for a while. So that gave me some experience on what it was to be on the other side of a, of a conductor of baton. Wonderful, wonderful. And how is the compositional process from you, for you? I mean, I, I imagine it might be different from piece to piece, but what is a typical, um, you know, do you have any rituals? How, how do you begin from the blank page? And uh, if you want to share how, how you go about composing a new piece. You know, I, I suppose it's not so different at the very start from us composers. Uh, facing the blank page is a little intimidating always. You know, you always feel that you're not going to make it. And, and then things start to flow and and then you find your way through the music but uh, there is no given formula but there is for sure discipline and technique you know that get you through the hardest times those days where you are not full with uh, inspiration filled with inspiration but then you just have to plow through you know and just keep working because that work even though it might not give results immediately maybe the next day or two days later uh, those ideas will start will start to develop so it's a little bit like that, you know, you can't just give up that easily and, and it is a roller coaster uh, intellectually and emotionally too, because you're very much involved, it's very personal, it's very intimate, um, but you have to learn, you know, well, especially if you're a freelance composer who's uh, living depends on it, you really have to find ways to, you know, perhaps live this passage and then tackle another one, or even if you're working on two pieces simultaneously, you know, put one aside and work on the other one it's um it's a matter of finding your ways but of course every piece has its own uh starting point and, and you know depending on where it's vocal or purely instrumental um there are a lot of factors that will you'll have to take into account at the beginning and do you tend to compose a lot at the keyboard do you do you sing what you compose what, what are some of these things you do while you're working on the piece you know, I, I used to be very much drawn to the keyboard until my late teacher, Enrique Turriaga, uh, started to try to drag me out of it because he said my writing for other instruments was a bit pianistic, and he was right. 
So I wasn't thinking that idiomatically uh, about the instruments. And, and I now deliberately try to detach myself from the keyboard. I do have one right next to me, but I only consult it when I have to. And of course, you know, with computer programs, you can use playback sometimes to get an idea of what's happening. But, but you know, none of that is really a reliable source uh, until you go to the live performance. So you mostly have to, you know, it's a trial and error process. It's always been like that. Uh, when you you have to, you know, you have the, the knowledge to test and experiment things, but there's always something you won't know. And there's always something you will find out, you know, uh, or perhaps you have something uh, a lingering doubt that you need to clarify. I'll call a friend who's an expert in the instrument and I'll just try to figure it out. I mean, it's, you, you have to be humble enough to understand uh, your shortcomings always. And yes, singing helps, especially if it's vocal music. Um, that's why I like to write in the solitude of my studios with anyone, no one listening to what I'm doing. Uh, standing up, uh, conducting in the air, uh, playing imaginary chords, all of that helps, whatever helps to get you immersed in the, in the world that you're trying to create. Cool. And so I'm, I'm curious a little bit, if we go back a little bit to your childhood, your early years growing up in Peru, then your path, uh, how did you end up in Finland? And then from Finland, how did you come to America? If you want to tell us a little bit about your path. Yeah, it's been a very exciting path, actually. I The first time I had, I was kind of taken out of my comfort zone uh, was when I was 11 years old. and. My family, we're a very small family, my, my, my parents and my sister, myself, so just four of us, we immigrated to Miami in 1990 uh, when you know things in Peru were not at its best, especially at the height of terrorism and a change of uh, government. So my dad um, took on a job there and, and, I, and I really felt completely uh, challenged by the whole situation, a new language, a new culture, a new context. But that actually gave me um, a lot of tools, you know, that I had to develop on, on how to adapt to new circumstances. We ended up coming back a year later. Uh, and then when I was 21, I decided to go to Finland. I had been hearing about it from a music critic in Peru who had been invited by the then ambassador of Finland in Peru. And this critic just came marveled, you know, at the incredible music scene, the amount of music he brought scores, he brought recordings, and I was just hooked. So I decided, you know, I wasn't really thinking of studying abroad. I just didn't know where. And Finland looked like a very attractive uh, place at that point in time. Also, it was relatively affordable and you didn't need to learn the language to go because if that had been a precondition, I don't think I would have probably ever stepped foot in it. I did learn Finnish and I do speak it to this day and I have friends in Finland and, and my sister actually for reasons that are completely different she also ended up living there. Oh. Um, so we have a strong connection with that country still. About the year 2007, uh, oh that's actually the year that I left Finland for uh, UC Berkeley in California. And I was in search of, first of all, I wanted to continue my studies, uh, do a doctoral degree and I just wanted the change of scenery. I had been kind of, I had soaked in uh, all the European uh, contemporary music scene. I had traveled extensively during those years in Finland, throughout Europe, and I was ready for, for something different. And at California attracted me because it's always been like a hub of creativity in many fields. And of course, there's a lot of very, very peculiar and very inquisitive minds, like, you know, think of the music of Henry Cowell, or Terry Riley, or even the birth of minimalism here. So I, I felt this is the place where I can, you know, really just try to reinvent myself. And I, that's exactly what I did. I came here at 28 and I just felt that, you know, I, it was a time when I was trying to enter some degree of maturity in my musical language. And it really helped me kind of uh, understand and distill, you know, what it was that I wanted to to be as a composer. And well, I, I, I completed my PhD in 2012 with Edmund Campion there. And I just felt that, you know, that that whole doctoral degree also was a bit of a, of a transition from me, from, from being a student, you know, into entering a fully professional life. So it had that double purpose. Wow. 
And right now you've just, you've recently, I remember we spoke last week and you've recently completed your third symphony, which is uh, so unusual for a composer these days, especially so, so young. And you've written many other orchestral works. You've also written an opera, an oratorio. Um, what is the next, uh, I mean, next or future piece you would like to compose, which you haven't done yet? And this is, you know, regardless of a commission or not, something that you feel deeply about or a specific, um, method that you haven't explored yet i mean i know you're very open and you're always willing to try new things so what is something that you haven't tried yet that you would like to, to do mm, that's an interesting idea well there are instruments i haven't written for that i would love to incorporate like the organ for example i haven't had a chance to include an organ in my works um i did write a ballad but it was a it was a, an early work uh, so i would love to try my hand at writing a ballad right now which would be quite an interesting idea. I have played around with or toyed around with the idea of writing music for for not film properly, but actually kind of um, kind of the music video format. You know, and this is something I tried uh, with director Kevin Newberry. We we created a short film called Epiphany Five based on one of my works, and I found that was a fascinating experiment. I just would love to continue exploring that path, you know. And I do see right now there's a lot of opera companies. Like I just saw Boston Lyric Opera, I saw the LA Opera producing films, operatic films that are quite fascinating, actually. Um, so I would love to continue exploring on that that vein. But in all honesty, actually, at the core of my work right now, I think my main interest continues to expand my symphonic catalog and hopefully write more opera, because those are two genres that uh, that I feel very much at home with and, uh, and and that I would love to, you know, that I think there's plenty to explore within them as well. And precisely following up on that, um, collaboration with text and working with uh, librettists, with a stage director, with the singers, um, as a composer, what what is essential to you in this type of work, this collaboration with so many moving parts? Yeah, well, the collaboration between composer and librettist has to be very, very frank, very, very straightforward, very honest, and very loving also in that, you know, if that doesn't really work, if you are not able to call your collaborator at odd times during the day or night, or if you're not able to, you know, to get an immediate response or the kind of um, artistic kind of alignment that you require for that to work, then probably the work is not gonna not gonna happen or shine to the degree it should. Um, I think I I experienced I was fortunate enough to work with Nilo Cruz on my opera and we hit it up really quickly. I mean I remember the first time we met, we were supposed to just have lunch to to get to know each other, and we ended up like just talking for five straight hours. You know, we wow. couldn't. So we were like really we knew that at that moment that. You know, I found him fascinating, he found me fascinating, and we just couldn't stop working about ideas already with what we had. So when you feel that kind of chemistry going on, that's when you know you're on the, on the right path. And then, of course, by extension, you know, when you work with a director, when you work with a conductor or a soloist, um, that one always aims at that chemistry being present, right? It won't always be the case. And that's fine as well. And you have to learn how to navigate those situations too. But I mean, um, there is nothing more rewarding than really working with someone who's like-minded and has the same kind of artistic goals as you do. Wow. So you've written so, so much orchestral music already. You've been a composer in residence with the Houston Symphony. I think you've collaborated closely with, with Andres Orozco Estrada with Miguel Hart Bedoya, of course, with Klaus Makela recently in your Concert Gepao debut. Um, what do you look for when you write orchestral music? Well, I look for colors. I look for hidden colors and palettes. And I, I look for sounds. And, and I look for emotions, rousing emotions. I look for excitement. and. You know, it's, um, I think that what attracts me to the orchestra and this incredible instrument is that it has the power to communicate to an extent that no other medium has. At least that's what I believe, you know. I, the grandeur, the incredible versatility, and the contrast between using a solo instrument and a massive orchestral sound in a Wagnerian sense or Malarian sense, uh, 
all of that, you know, kind of um, journey that you can take the listener through. Uh, it's something that has always been attracted me, especially in the great symphonists, you know, like Sibelius, Mahler, and even Prokofiev. So you feel um, that, it, first of all, is the sensual allure of sound, right? But then the more you dig into it, the more depth you can find, especially with the great composers, you're finding more and more layers uh, of musical elements talking to each other and informing each other. And then it's just, for me, it's just, um, kind of a full experience, you know, intellectual, emotional, physical, because you also feel in a whole, like the vibrations of the instruments and the way they come at you. Uh, like, like it's just something that I, I, I just like to, to be able to provide also to other people, you know, because I feel that that's something that I, if I could live in that world forever, that would be paradise, you know? <laughs> wow. So you mentioned Sibelius, you know, which um, his, his Finlandia became like a hymn for Finland. I don't know if this is something he might have resented. You know, he wrote so many other wonderful works, yet everybody immediately thought Finlandia or Richard Strauss. And he was 24 when he wrote the Don Juan. And of course, it, ca it catapulted him to international success. Um, in your case, you cannot deny that your fiesta, it was, you were extremely young when you wrote this and everybody knows this piece. It's a huge international success and it's been probably your most performed piece, I imagine. Um, I hope you don't resent that it made you so famous, this piece, because you know it's a, it's a beautiful piece, but you also have written so much more. Um, do you resent in any way the huge success of this piece or, or are you glad that it somehow made your, your name more known everywhere? Well, listen, um... You know, there is, there is, there is, resentment is too much of a strong word for sure. I think Fiesta has, has paid for many a meal, you know, at this exactly. point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and, and has done, and first of all, it has traveled well beyond, uh, you know, any, my imagination. And I, I really haven't, um, haven't, I did, I actually now stopped finally counting how many times it's been played because I, I made this kind of hobby for myself. And, when I noticed that it was getting so many performances, I should have said, oh, I should go back and really check. So we hit performance number 100, I think last year with Miguel precisely conducting New Zealand. And I felt, well, at this point in time, I'll just let it go. But I felt that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, it was an important piece in my development, like orchestrally speaking, it is, um, I never thought it would, it would achieve that degree of recognition. It might be a number of factors, starting with the title, the content, the allusions it makes, uh, it makes, um, and the ease uh, of like that it has two instrumentations, right? That it's, it makes it very malleable that you can play it as a symphonietta for or as a symphony orchestra for. Um, and you know that it blends a lot of different things. So, yeah, I, it doesn't represent who I am as a composer right now in 2021, but at the same time, it is a good entrance for many people it has been a good entry point toward my music in that perhaps people who wouldn't be otherwise interested towards what i write um, they found fiesta attractive and they felt oh what else does this composer have to offer and then they they will go through so you know as an entry port uh it toward my work and even for some people towards contemporary music because it's been played in uh, sometimes uh, programs that were mostly uh, um, dealing with pop music or popular music, you know, and then you will have this piece that was kind of symphonic and that was seen as somewhere in between or crossing genres. And, and then that will, for those listeners, it will be like something like a completely different world. So no, I mean, I, um, I, I certainly hope it won't be the only piece that will survive because, <laughs> you know, we, there are composers who, who are known for like one piece and, and, after like a century after they pass, but that's not for me to decide. I mean, I all I can say is I um, every composer should try to write uh, his or every single piece as if it were the last. You know, so you you put your best, and and that you any of those works might end up being your presentation card, and uh, you have to be ready for that. So your best, you know, put out your best every time, and what survives and what doesn't is. is beyond you definitely definitely now the next question i want to ask is uh, you know being a latino artist what what do you think uh, we should try and help 
change in the classical music world and this is in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion. What is it that we could do to, to make this a more equitable type of business? Well, you know, I'm going to respond this I, with one quote. And I say this because I, I attended um, the Sphinx Connect conference in Detroit uh, a few years ago. And I remember someone was asking Afad Working, who is a lead of that organization, they asked her, so what kind of world or what kind of future do you envision for the Sphinx organization? And as we know, the Sphinx organization really, you know, tries to um, put forth the work of Latino and Black uh, artists, especially started with string musicians, but all of artists. And then she said, uh, well, I hope for a future where the Sphinx organization is no longer needed. And I think I will put it that way. I think right now we're in the middle of a, a struggle of trying to earn a place still, even though South America has created, you know, uh, lasting works and has produced a plethora of great composers. Um, there is a tendency to showcase our music within the Latino or the Hispanic Heritage Month or whatever other context you might want to frame it. Um, and that is good, but it also sets us like as the other. I would love for a more integrated approach where, you know, Latino composers are allowed to just um, exercise really their imagination uh, without any expectation. And that, you know, whatever opportunity is given to them, uh, that it is, uh, that, you know, their heritage is taken into account, but it is also not a requirement in a sense. I've, uh, you know, I, and I think each composer should also be free to choose whether or not, you know, to, to freely uh, portray, for example, their heritage. And I think some of them are doing this marvelously. I, I've seen Juan Pablo Contreras uh, from Mexico who, who really heavily draws on his Mexican heritage. And that's wonderful because it is genuine and you can feel it. The same goes for Gabriela Frank, you know. Um, there is other composers like from Brazil, uh, Marcos Balter, or perhaps even Felipe Lara, who's obvious, is not that obvious, you know, the influence of their uh, countries of honor, origin, and that's fine as well. And, um, but what is important too is that, that, you know, I think our presence um, has to be, it has to happen at all levels, at all levels of management as well. As well. You know, the more um, people of Hispanic or Latino heritage we have leading orchestras uh, in boards, uh, leading uh, or becoming music critics as well, uh, the more people you have at all levels, then the more you will see of, of this. Um, I, I never wanted to be kind of seen as, oh, this is, we have to fill a quote, you know. And, and hence, we will uh, hire or, or ask for a Latino composer because we're missing one. I would will, I will just, of course, in an ideal world, that all of that is taken into account, but it is not the one reason why we're doing it. Yeah. I guess it's also something very important that you mentioned in passing, I think, if I understood correctly, is um, the freedom and the openness and the, the, there shouldn't be an expectation that because you were born in such and such place you should write this kind of music but you know if uh, Sibelius and Mahler are big influences for you then you know you might as well take that as, as your main influence why not correct correct and I think we we also live in a very cosmopolitan and globalized world uh, where you know the boundaries are starting to get blurred and myself, after having, you know, lived in basically South America, Europe, and the United States, I feel that all of those influences have, you know, a very strong pull, a gravitational pull in all directions. And I am, I am Peruvian and of Peruvian descent, but I, that alone will not be able to define me, you know, because those seven years in Finland were key. And the fact that I live here in the U.S. and I'm a citizen of the U.S. is, is not something you can, you can ignore. So I think it's, what is more interesting is to see, I mean, those times of like the, 
the nationalism in, uh, like around the turn of the century that uh that is a, that was a moment in time and that was necessary for sure to um to better uh, classify the identity of uh, certain nations mm -hmm. and i feel that uh, but i feel that now we are moving towards a more mobile society and that's that's kind of inevitable so i find eclecticism also attractive and i find uh, all of that should be definitely encouraged you know uh, to work and cross-culturally interact with other people uh, so yes i think we we should continue to to bring the wealth of culture that we have uh, in south america but i think it also comes naturally you know i can't avoid it it just it's in my blood so whatever i write some of it will just end up coming out <laughs> in the music definitely, definitely so you've mentioned gabriela frank which of course she was born in the u.s but she's got peruvian heritage uh, we mentioned Miguel Harbedoya, a wonderful Peruvian uh, conductor, also born, also based in the U.S. I can also think of Juan Diego Flores, another remarkable Peruvian musician who also trained uh, in, at the Curtis Institute in the U.S. Uh, how come there are so many incredible Peruvian musicians, including yourself? What, what's <laughs> going on? What, what do you guys drink? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can say the same with Argentinian musicians. I mean... Uh, there is, I think we are, um, there's a few of us who are doing work and I think we, we are closely knit, uh, interconnected with each other. I've, I've met Juan Diego, I've even worked with him once. Miguel has worked with him. Uh, Miguel has also championed Gabriela's work and my work for sure. Uh, so, so we try to, you know, we know that it's, we're a small nation of 30 million people. Um, but we do have a, a very rich uh, musical heritage as well, of which we're very proud. And um, and I think we're passionate about what we do, but we also understand that, you know, in, in unity comes strength. And if um, we are able to join forces, then we'll be able to, to rise, you know, up higher. Because otherwise, if we just fight our individual battle battles, um, it's going to take forever. But I, but I think that um, this is really genuine. It was never a concerted kind of agreement that we all had. Okay, we're going to work together and make this work. Um, I think each of us rose to, you know, the top of their profession independently. But, you know, once we are there, we really want to want to collaborate. And Miguel especially has been uh, such a great influence. And he's not only for me, I must say, not only for Peruvian composers, but for many Latin American composers. Yeah, yeah he's a great champion of... of... All, all new music composers, really. Okay. Um, so a very short and simple question, but probably hard to answer. Um, what would you say is the role of music nowadays? Oof. Well, I think <laughs> first thing that comes to mind, I think it has many roles indeed. Um, you know, it, but it basically, we need to, I think, understand especially when it comes to the music we cultivate, right? Um, we have seen a historic trend, a declining trend in terms of uh, the reach that what the work we do has had. Uh, but I do feel that, that there is a role for us now and in the future. And I do think that it has to be, it cannot just revive on its own. You know, it has to be helped. It has to be, um, it, we, precisely because of the nature of what we do is not commercial. Uh, it won't, by uh, its own merits, be able to reach you know, a, a larger uh, group of people. So for example, a country that I admire very much, Finland, where I live a lot, um, they do have programs um, deliberately uh, designed to support the creation of new works uh, in that they are. They give grants, for example, for composers uh, to basically for years, like sometimes between one year, two or five years. It used to be even to ten to fifteen years, where they will give these grants for them to create, and um, that meant, of course, that the composer was able to concentrate on writing music and not on, on you know, paying rent. That's to, just to put it plainly, and. In, in the society where we live, you know, in the US, I think there's so many marvelous things. And I mean, I've been able to flourish in these societies, so I'm very thankful. 
and I think it is it it, it allows you to to rise and, and to flourish as well. But I think more has to be done uh, to enable and support the role of artists. I think, and a lot of that comes from private donors here, uh, not very much from the state. Um, I recently read a statement from Yannick Nzet Zegan uh, from the Philadelphia Orchestra uh, that was addressed to Joe Biden. And I really enjoyed it because that letter mentioned the need to have someone like a minister of culture, basically. I think he was advocating for someone at the highest um, levels of government who will be uh, advocating for cu culture and the arts. And I do think that uh, government can play a role in this. And I think it's not too late. We will never be Europe and we don't have to. You know, we're, you know, state is the, basically the one exclusive channel through which all the funds for the arts are, are, are funneled. Um, but I think uh, a hybrid role here will be very much welcome. So all of this to say that, you know, music is, is, is gives employment to many people. Uh, uh, it music, it's, feeds the soul and has been the one source sometimes of entertainment and solace for a lot of people during the pandemic. And we need to understand that that is being created by artists who also need um, to, to find a way to make their living. And, and we know that you know, music has a power to communicate emotions in a very direct way, uh, sometimes without words. And that it, uh, it is this direct channel that I believe in the most, actually, because I think it is a language that can pierce to the soul and can communicate things and enhance emotions, enhance emotions in the way that other arts cannot. So the role it has for me, and just to close all of these thoughts, is that very much what I think in the, perhaps the ancient Greeks saw it. I saw it as essential, you know. The music for me, it has to be part of education. Is part of uh, um, of uh, cultivating the human soul. It, it, it has to be understood as such, and um, it, and it marries all these qualities. It marries it marries math. It marries uh, beauty. It marries um, spirituality as well. So it can be a source of, of, of inspiration for all those, you know, for all of all of humanity. Honestly, you've mentioned the pandemic. So I want to ask you how it has affected you personally. I know you, you've been composing uh, but um, if there is anything you, you like to share what have been your your source of inspiration during you know these times that have been difficult for everybody well i i had to i had a, a commission that thank god was uh, confirmed right around uh, the time that we were entering lockdown and so had i not signed that contract contract i i could have been unemployed for the remainder of 2020 so luckily that didn't happen, and I, I was able to write precisely that third symphony. So that project is going on, uh, but of course we had to to you know change it a little bit because um, it was already dealing with the issue of, of um, not exactly climate change, but like the way in which humans and human activity has altered um, the landscape and and the globe. It, it is called Altered Landscape, as a matter of fact, and is uh, inspired by a photographic collection that is housed at the Nevada Museum. So because it was dealing with this issue already, we decided that it was only natural for us to incorporate the pandemic into it and, and to reflect on how you know, this act, you know, activity that humans have had um, has, has altered uh, the, you know, the percentages of, of carbon emissions and the amount of travel. I mean, there are many ways to measure the impact that humanity has had. And especially during the last 70 years or so, which has been known, uh, got to be known as the great acceleration because you see that all these factors have exponentially exploded. You know? We see it in climate, uh, global warming as well. But the pandemic was an interesting point where everything came to a halt. And uh, it kind of forced us to reckon uh, with what we have done, really. And and I think all of us needed that. And so it 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 was impossible for me not to find a way to incorporate that into what I was writing, because otherwise I would have had to stop writing. And I felt that it was very healing as well uh, to be able to not only incorporate that idea, but to channel it through the music. 
So that was one thing, and the other is another song that I wrote also during, uh, inspired by, by this with text by Mark Campbell for a soprano, mezzo soprano Sasha Cook, oh. and that was um, a, a very short song, but it was talking about the longing of going back to the stage, right, and and, and the separation for that. So I think those two works kept me going because I, um, there were days that it was really difficult just to find any any source of inspiration. And uh, and I know that there have been colleagues who, um, uh, you know, have been less fortunate. And you know, I've done everything I can in my way to give assistance or help. And I think a lot of the community really came together. Uh, we did come together for those for those who needed help. And I feel that uh, this is the way it should be. You know, because you never know what I mean. As a freelance composer, life is very uncertain. It's very exciting, but it's very uncertain too. But the one thing that keeps us going is really is the art itself, right? the satisfaction that one day the music is going to be played. I mean, I've been writing a lot of music and I haven't heard any of it. So I'm really eager to go back to the concert hall and just listen to what I've been writing. I'm sure. And I can't wait to hear your, your new pieces as well, especially the songs for Sasha. Uh, she's an incredible artist and she recently uh, participated also with us in a remote orchestra, Urlicht. Uh, oh, singing from mm -hmm. Texas. I'll, I'll have to send it to you. She, she's just so wonderful. Um, and I know you have to go very soon. So I have one last question, which is um, your advice for young musicians, either up and coming composers or anybody, really anything that you find helpful that helps you when you're feeling down and trying to, you know, continue working and getting better. Yeah. Advice. First of all, persistence. Right. Um, the need for validation um, has to stop in the sense that try not to look for validation for external sources of validation because that can be addictive and it can be um, damaging. And you need to be sure of what you do. You have to create and be able to, to somehow sculpt that conviction within yourself uh, to a point that it is very solid and you know that what you're doing is good. And it, of course, one always has to learn. One cannot be arrogant. There's always place to learn. But, you know, we, my appreciation of myself doesn't depend on whether a music critic likes my music or doesn't. Um, because both praise and criticism um, are something that I, you know, I, I look at them and I put them aside, but I don't let them affect uh, affect my my own uh, concept of myself, and I don't let them affect the way I value myself as an artist. And in our field, because we're always subject to criticism and out, outer, you know, influences, we might, you know, we might be swaying back and forth uh, depending on what people think of us or don't. That's one thing. Uh, the other is make sure to put your work out there. If you're very young and you don't have like a publisher and you don't have orchestras to play your music and you don't have a record label to put your music out, well, go there, gather your friends and record your music and make it available by every means you can. Uh, nowadays, we live in a place where technology has been able to democratize kind of that. So uh, there is no excuse for not having a good website with uh, decent materials uh, because people will make decisions based on that as well and and keep writing especially for composers uh, there is uh, you know there will be lots of things that you might need to do i myself have had to do odd jobs in my youth to be able to just keep going but you know you have to reach a point where you say well regardless of what i'm doing i won't stop writing and there is something about writing every day, even if it's just an hour or a few minutes that you can devote at the end of the day, you might be tired and all that, but there is something in your mind that keeps working. You know? For the rest of the day, you'll be thinking about that musical idea and you'll be able to come back to it and it will grow with, with, within you. If you really stop working for like a month or two, uh, getting back into shape is really tough. It's almost like working out, to be honest with you. It's like mental gymnastics. <laughs> so, so don't give away. No, don't give up on the on the on the routine and the discipline of, of writing constantly. 
And the last one, just, um, you know, there is a fine line between putting yourself forward and, you know, being too pushy about it. And I, I myself am very worried about, you know, looking for the right opportunity, but not insisting beyond the point. So that is also a delicate line to navigate, but don't, don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, to those who have shown interest in your work and who, who have shown faith in what you do, um, do go ask for help, and if they can, they will provide you with that help. You know, if they, and if they, if they can or if they want to. Um, but yeah, you, they will. And I generally, what, what I may experience as being is like when they, when people see that you're making the effort, when they don't see you just asking for favors, but they see that you're actually doing the work, and you just need a helping hand to make to take the step forward. Someone will come and will give you that help. And, and you'll be able to take this step. Jimmy, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to, to hear you uh, express yourself in a variety of topics. And, and I know uh, the time is up now, but uh, I really want to thank you because it's been wonderful to, to, to have you for this conversation. Thank you, Christian. I'm glad we were, we were able to make it possible. Yeah, uh, I look forward to hearing your, your new pieces. <laughs> absolutely. We'll be in touch. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.